Good morning and welcome to today's symposium. It's titled Individualized Secondary Preventive Strategies in PAD, the Emerging Role of Factor 10A in Anticoagulation. It's really a pleasure to have three fantastic faculty members that will discuss a little bit about what exactly we're doing presently for preventive strategies in patients with peripheral arterial disease, and then discuss the emergent role of factor 10A anticoagulation. We have Dr. Michael Jaff, Dr. Joshua Beckman, and Dr. Fadi Saab. I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Jaff for his first, for, to be our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this uh, symposium entitled Individualized Secondary Preventive Strategies in PAD, the Emerging Role of Factor 10A Anticoagulation. Uh, it's great to be part of this faculty. Uh, here are the lists of uh, conflicts of interest uh, by each presenter, including myself. And these are the learning objectives for this symposium. First, to recognize the downstream clinical and socioeconomic consequences of suboptimal secondary preventive practices in PAD. Secondarily, to evaluate the clinical trial data surrounding the efficacy and safety of factor 10A anticoagulation for the secondary prevention of MACE and MIL across the PAD patient population. And finally, integrate the latest clinical data and guideline recommendations into comprehensive and individualized secondary preventive strategies for patients with PAD. So with that as a backdrop, let me go into my presentation. I was asked to discuss the clinical and socioeconomic burdens of peripheral artery disease. And everybody who's at this meeting understands that vascular disease as a cause of death is a big deal anywhere in the world compared to other chronic conditions that result in death. Uh, vascular causes lead the charge as far as causes of death. And when you look at the underlying risk factors that suggest atherosclerosis, these are quite similar in the PAD patient population than what you would expect in other atherosclerotic syndromes like coronary and cerebrovascular disease. However, it's worthwhile to pause on the link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. This is a very large 1.9 million person study that looked at the incidence of different types of cardiovascular disease in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. And when you look at the actual causes or forms of atherosclerosis that occur, notice that peripheral artery disease is top of the list linked directly to type 2 diabetes. It's quite striking. I don't want us to forget, however, that this is not only about reducing mortality rates, although that's obviously central to everything we try and do. However, when you look at the physical conditioning of patients with PAD, they are dramatically impaired. Compare them to class three congestive heart failure or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Notice that patients with intermittent claudication the most common symptom of peripheral artery disease are as disabled, and certainly way more so than the average well adult. Now, every single study that's looked at the natural history of patients with PAD suggests that the survival rates with claudication is only about 75% at five years, and the vast uh, number of people who die with PAD die because of atherosclerosis in other vascular beds. This Venn diagram demonstrates this association between PAD, cerebrovascular disease, and coronary artery disease. And it's very easy to take a comparison between the most advanced form of peripheral artery disease, that is critical limb ischemia, and look at survival rates compared to common cancers, which clearly the public worries more about. And you can see here with the advantages in therapy for common malignancies, mortality rates with critical limb ischemia have skyrocketed and remain a major health hazard. Now I'd like to cover some of the disparities that are found in patients with PAD. This is really quite sobering. This is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which looked at patients with PAD versus those without PAD. And first of all, let's just look at how patients are treated, looking at the use of statins and ACE inhibitors and antiplatelet therapy. I mean, it is really dramatic, the reduction in appropriate medical therapies offered 
to these unfortunate patients with PAD. And I would suggest that one of the reasons that these patients with PAD have a shortened survival, that is a greater mortality rate, is because they are not effectively and appropriately treated with antiplatelet therapy, antihypertensive therapy, statins, tobacco cessation, and tight glycemic control. And then when you look at the worst of scenarios, the expert consensus guidelines document, which documents which drive guidelines-based medical therapies, patients with PAD are clearly inadequately managed. I mean, look at this. Less than 20% of PAD patients are actually prescribed a statin. And only a quarter of all PAD patients are actually offered antiplatelet therapy. This just can't continue. Now, the GRACE study looked even at things like known associations. So patients with PAD compared to those without who were offered coronary revascularization or even looking for occult coronary artery disease, uh, it's really quite dramatic, the difference. The same story about the lack of medical therapy prescribed, this population of patients is disadvantaged. Even things like counseling on smoking cessation which just should be part of every visit with every PAD patient. Here's the aspirin example. Here's the lipid-lowering therapy. Here's aspirin at discharge. That's in patients who've just been hospitalized for PAD. It's really uh, under-recognized and under-treated. And then finally, in the PVI registry, part of the uh, uh, American College of Cardiology NCDR registry. These are patients who actually were coming for a peripheral vascular intervention. That is, their diagnosis been, has been made and it's been determined that they need a revascularization. Notice that in patients who uh, undergo a revascularization and have a prior history of coronary artery disease or other previous peripheral interventions, even after peripheral vascular intervention, not the entirety of the population is treated with effective anti-atherosclerotic therapy. And it's quite clear that the likelihood of having an adverse peripheral artery event is higher in the patients with, pop, uh, with uh, diabetes. And so clearly, this is a population that needs aggressive attention. Now let's look at individual subtypes, populations that are really disadvantaged. Let's look at the elderly. After all, atherosclerosis is a disorder of the older age population, and certainly the elderly have a higher prevalence of lower extremity peripheral artery disease. They have a reduced ability to report their walking limitations. 15 to 20 percent of the elderly population can't walk on a treadmill to undergo basic testing. If they need a procedure, their success rates are lower, the complication rates are higher, and the costs increase with age. What about women? Interestingly enough, as the populations of men and women with PAD age, there's similar prevalence of PAD in women to men. They present at an older age and have a greater list of comorbidities at the time of their diagnosis. They're less likely to have classic symptoms of claudication. Similar story in coronary disease where they have atypical angina. Their baseline ankle brachial index at the time of diagnosis is lower, suggesting that they have a higher burden of atherosclerotic disease of the lower extremities. They have lower exercise capacity, a worse quality of life, worse outcomes after vascular surgery, and more often undergo repeated endovascular procedures to improve their symptoms and limb salvage. And what about minorities? So over the past several years, more data is coming out about minorities with PAD. Take, for example, African Americans who have a higher PAD prevalence than non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics. African Americans are more likely to undergo non-invasive Im imaging than they would to undergo catheter-based angiography and intervention. Because of that, they present later in their disease course, so they'll present with much more severe PAD, that is critical limb ischemia, than in patients with claudication. They uh, are more likely to have repeat interventions to give them some sort of an outcome, and in fact, their long-term outcome is not as good. And then finally, African Americans and, His and Hispanics have poorer outcomes than non-Hispanic whites following vascular surgery. This is a uh, recent study that looked at 
the influence of race on the management of lower extremity ischemia, you can see that uh, there was quite a difference between the African American population and the overall population when you look at amputation rates. This is looking at the odds ratio of, uh, of having a, a significant adverse outcome in populations who are African American versus the entire population. And as patients age, the amputation rate rises in the, in the uh, African American population versus the non-Hispanic white population. Finally, one of the most sobering stories of all is, believe it or not, even disparities exist based on income. This is actually a map of Los Angeles County, and it shows you that the uh, poorer the population, the higher the risk of amputation in patients with diabetes. This is, again, showing you income uh, levels below 200% of the poverty level, so really marked discrepancies in one county, in one city, in one state, in the United States for outcomes and amputations. And then this is really intense. Look at Malibu and Beverly Hills. Those are not exactly communities that one would consider uh, lower socioeconomic classes. Compare their amputation rates, which are way at the bottom, to those everywhere else in the state of California. Really sobering. Now finally, what about the costs of care for PAD? Well, we know that readmission rates after hospitalizations are a driver of cost. And the 30-day readmissions after revascularization for critical limb ischemia is one in five. So that's quite high. We also did a study looking at the Medicare population to try and figure out if the decision about initial uh, endovascular therapy drove cost. So what we did was we did this cohort study this has been submitted for publication, taking patients who were treated from July of 2015 through December of 2016 with any endovascular therapy for Rutherford uh, class 1 to 4 claudication or rest pain. We followed their care for one year after their index procedure. You can see that drug-coated balloons, which were released the quarter before we started collecting this data, has increased quarter over quarter since they were released. You'll notice here that drug-coated balloons have the lowest initial and 365-day cost to Medicare. They have the lowest retreatment rates of all the different comparative therapies. And when you look at what would happen to the Medicare budget if all patients received DCB as their initial treatment, you would save Medicare on an annual basis over $110 million. So in conclusions, PAD is a common disorder. It's associated with impaired physical functioning and longevity. Patients with PAD are undertreated. The socioeconomic class, race, and gender all reflect inadequate treatment and increased risk of adverse outcomes. And modern management of PAD is very expensive. It's incumbent upon us to recognize these patients and give them full court, aggressive anti-atherosclerotic therapy to prolong their lives and improve their quality of life. Thanks very much for your attention. Michael, that was fantastic. With that, I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Joshua Beckman. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to participate in this really interesting session. My charge today is to discuss the successes and challenges in secondary preventive strategies in PAD. Here are my disclosures. Some of them are relevant, but not really to this process. These are more about some of the newer medications. The agenda for this talk will be the following. We'll talk about the current guideline recommendations for antiplatelet therapy across PAD patient populations. I'll then discuss barriers to optimal secondary prevention, both patient and provider unawareness. We'll talk about lack of guideline adherence and the persistent need for intensification in key populations. And then we'll talk about translating evidence to practice, the clinical implications and daily management of our patients. So let's start off with what are the rules and regulations for the care of these patients. And this is basically straight out of the guidelines and uh, we'll describe guideline-directed antithrombotic therapy. Over the course of about 20 years now, here are all the relevant studies about antiplatelet agents in peripheral artery disease. We start off with the paper published in 1994 from the antiplatelet trialist collaboration that demonstrated across a wide variety of studies that antiplatelet therapy was beneficial for patients with PAD. 
We then move into some of the thionopyridine work, looking at ticlopidine and then clopidogrel, demonstrating that those agents seem to be a bit better than aspirin. We then move into primary prevention, looking in the diabetic subjects in Papadad, uh, and also in patients who are just screened at, at older ages in the AAA study where aspirin did not work. We finally move back to some success, taking a look at Vorapaxar, which is a thrombin receptor antagonist demonstrating some benefits. And interestingly, it's the first agent that showed some benefit in limbs. We find out later that all thionopyridines or P2Y12 inhibitors, ticagrelor and clopidogrel, are equivalent. And then most recently, we have the COMPASS trial stopping early because of a uh, pretty impressive benefit. And if you just understand these studies, you basically understand the state of play today with antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy. Here's how we can take a look of how things have developed over the course of time. Or on the top, what you can see are the different studies that I mentioned based on the dates when they came out. And then you can see when the guidelines were first written in 2005, updated in 2011, and the most recent ones came out in 2016, which you'll see came before the publication of COMPASS. So the guideline recommendations reflect where we were a couple of years ago, and this is normal in the process. Guidelines are supposed to make sure that we are doing exactly the right things. They're not supposed to be the most up-to-date documents that are taking a look at the newest data, much more of what's been accepted by the community and how to move forward. Let's take a look at what the guidelines say, and the color coding tells a lot of the story. Green is go, red is stop. Guideline recommendations are made based on class. Class one is these are things that you should do. Class three are these are things you should not do. And 2A and 2B separate into should probably and should probably not, maybe on an individualized basis. And so what you can see here is that for the patients that have symptomatic peripheral artery disease, Everybody needs an antiplatelet or antithrombotic agent, either aspirin or clopidogrel. For the asymptomatic peripheral artery disease patients, you can be on either one, again, aspirin or clopidogrel. And that is basically where our you should be doing these things kind of ends. We have data demonstrating that aspirin or clopidogrel in patients with borderline PAD doesn't really work, so don't do it. We have patients who are on both agents, dual antiplatelet therapy, or DAPT, as you see on the screen. That was tested in a large clinical trial and didn't work in patients with PAD. We, can also know, we also know that it didn't reduce limb events either. Vorapaxar was one study, uh, and in, a, uh, sing, in the way that we evaluated it, it didn't seem to have much of a reduction in the major adverse cardiovascular events, although it didn't seem to have some impressive limb events. But because it's one study and wasn't repeated, it's a, uh, eh, maybe. We know that anticoagulation to keep open vein grafts is really just based on small studies and uh, more practice rather than evidence. So, you know, use it on an individualized basis. And we also know that the use of anticoagulation with warfarin is frankly harmful and causes more intracranial hemorrhage and should not be used routinely in our patients with peripheral artery disease. So now that we know what to do with antithrombotic therapy, what are the barriers to discovery? How come we can't find the magic map to get us to the point of treasure? Well, I want to first review quite quickly what have we been doing over the course of the last couple of decades. And the first study here comes from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. This is put out by the federal government every five to six years, looking at uh, all patients in the population. And what you can see just take a look at the patients who have peripheral artery disease in the left column. Only 64% of them were on an aspirin, and uh, only about 70% were on a statin. And if you take a look at the patients who don't have coronary artery disease, you can see that a large number of these folks remain off the key therapies. We move up in time by about five years to a surgical trial of patients, all of whom were revascularized for critical limb ischemia, and even in this group of extraordinarily sick PAD patients, you can see that aspirin was only used in about 80% and statins in less than half. It's clear that for, through the first decade of this century, we were not using medical therapy appropriately to reduce adverse events. We move forward in time to a, the Viborg screening study, which was done in 50,000 people in Northern Europe. And again, you can see here that these were the folks who were collected around 2010 to 2012, statins are used in only 60%, antiplatelet therapy used in only 
So far over the course of about 15 years, we have made not one improvement in our usage of medicines that have been demonstrated to reduce adverse events in our patients. Finally, we can take a look at the Euclid study. This was uh, about 8,000 patients published in 2017. And what you can see here, and I think something that will be important to understand later, is that all the patients here had peripheral artery disease. But if the patients were recruited on the basis of needing a revascularization or procedure, they were much more likely to get therapy than if they were just recruited because they were found based on a physiological test, the ABI. What this tells me is that interventionalists are well poised and commonly use these therapies, at least in part to make sure that their therapies work. Patients who have peripheral artery disease but do not need an intervention are treated far less well, as you can see here by looking at the right column. This tells me that we either have a lot of work to do or a lot of opportunity to really improve how our patients are doing. The other thing is that I don't think anybody takes off the shoes and socks of patients when they come into the office. I mean, I myself have gone to my own primary care physician. He has done his full clinical examination, and we're talking about things like blood pressure and cholesterol. And I say, Will, how come you didn't take off my shoes and socks to feel my pulses? And he sort of looks at me and he goes, well, you know, for you, you could do it better than I do it. But I actually think that this doesn't happen commonly in the office at all. And when I ask around, maybe 10, 20% of the folks take off the shoes and socks of their patients routinely. But if what you can see here from this really interesting study, a small study of 18,600 men, is that if you can't feel the pulse, there's a really good chance that the patient has peripheral artery disease and needs to be uh, diagnosed with a simple test, the ankle brachial index. And in fact, if they don't have any of the four pulses in their feet, half of them, half of them will have PAD. It is not hard to diagnose this disease. We're just not doing it. And so one of the things I would say is, if we only looked a little bit in the older folks, we would find it all over the place. The other problem is that we, are, we all have learned really well the textbook definition of symptoms. And about half the people will have symptoms, and the symptoms will be pain in their muscles when they walk. But that represents only about 20% of all the people that have symptoms. Most people have atypical symptoms. It's because when you get into the older ages, you also have a little bit of arthritis and a little bit of back problems and a little bit of limb swelling. And so each of these things causes discomfort when you walk, and so they don't actually follow the textbook. But if you took a look at the folks who have these kind of symptoms, somewhere between 10 and 20% of them will have peripheral artery disease. And that's a pretty, pretty good screen for trying to figure out who has the disease. So now that, I, now that we know who has the problem and what the evidence is for using it and how we're not using it, how do you translate this evidence into practice? Well, I think one way you can do it is by doing screening, and screening works. So in this large screening study that I mentioned from before, they randomized the care of 50,000 men in central Denmark, and 25,000 of them got usual care, and 25,000 were invited for screening, only 18,700 showed up. But in the group that showed up, 11% of those patients had peripheral artery disease, 3% of those people had abdominal aortic aneurysm, and about 10% had newly diagnosed high blood pressure, and this was not just regular run-of-the-mill high blood pressure, this was high blood pressure where the systolic pressure was over 160. This is pretty serious stuff. How do we know that screening works? Well, the first thing I can tell you is that when the new diagnosis was made, doctors changed their behavior and added new therapies like, this, like the lipid-lowering therapies and antiplatelet therapies that I've been discussing throughout the talk. The next thing I'll show you is that if you just take a look at the last line, the bottom line, you can see that all-cause mortality was reduced. There aren't that many things that we do in the office as a screening test that reduce death. And in fact, there's only one other screening study that's recommended that reduces all-cause mortality, and that's lung cancer screening in smokers. Mammography is commonly used as a screening method to try and reduce breast cancer-related deaths. And just to put this in perspective, you had to screen about 160 people here to reduce one death. For breast cancer, you have to screen 1,330 women every two years for 10 years to reduce one breast cancer-related death. 
And so if we do that commonly in the population, which we do, I can't see why we wouldn't institute the same kind of ankle brachial index PAD screening program that was done in this trial. And again, here's what happens when you make the diagnosis. The upper line are patients who were found to have the disease, and you can see that there's a sudden increase in their use of, of therapies that are beneficial. These are antiplatelet therapies and antilipid therapies. Now, for me, I think if I had to make one intervention here, my goal would be to find the people that are doing uh, either surgeries or angioplasties in the lower extremity. Why? Because they also want to make sure that their procedures work. So I think that is the group of people who should be trying to institute much better medical therapy. There's a couple of things that come along with being able to do procedures. One, the doctor that referred the patient to you thinks you are the expert. And if you are the expert and you do it, they will not change your medical therapy. Two, we are finding the sickest patients and making sure that all of them get the right therapies. And three, this is a very large co uh, cohort of patients that will come to get care even if we don't necessarily pick it up first. So I think this presents a great opportunity. This presents uh, the opportunity for specialists to demonstrate their expertise. And then once specialists demonstrate their expertise, people in primary care will follow their lead and extend these therapies out to other patients that need them. So in conclusion, I'll say the guidelines are current as of three years ago. Our ability to find patients with PAD is poor. We have to get them to take off their socks in the office. Our treatment frequency of, PD, of PAD is mediocre, and we can do a lot better, and it doesn't have to be that hard. And I think that intervention represents a really good opportunity to improve medical therapy. Thanks for your attention. It's Fadi Saab. Um, I'm a cardiovascular specialist, and um, I am privileged today to speak about the role of factor 10A anticoagulation in patients who prefer arterial disease. These are my disclosures. And uh, my previous colleagues have spoken about this extensively in terms of the prevalence of per peripheral arterial disease and the impact uh, this disease have, uh, the, uh, and, and the impact that this disease has on, on patients' outcomes. Um, uh, also, uh, my uh, previous colleagues spoke about the atypical nature of uh, peripheral vascular disease and PAD presentation. And I was, uh, I always mention to our fellows that we have to reconsider the way we ask our patients about their symptoms so they cannot, we should not ask only about leg pain. We always have to ask about leg symptoms. Now, the current medical therapy um, when it comes to antiplatelet therapy is interesting. What I'm going to try to do today is kind of take you through uh, my thought process in terms of antiplatelet therapy selection for patients with peripheral arterial disease and critical limb ischemia. Because not all the trials have examined uh, this patient uh, subgroup, uh, especially the CLI subgroup, um, when it comes to antiplatelet therapy. So for example, this is an older trial, the NHANES trial. Basically, 30% of the patients were taking statins. About 25% of the patients were on ACE inhibitors. 35% of the patients were only receiving aspirin. And among patients with PAD and no other cardiovascular event, the use of multiple preventive therapy was associated with a 65% lower all-cause mortality. So um, in PAD patients, the use of antiplatelet therapy, or at least aspirin, is relatively beneficial. When you look at the aspirin therapy alone, so you have multiple trials, and again, they were touched on a little bit before, but I'm going to try to focus on the PAD population and the CLI population. In the POPAD and the AAA trials, compared low-dose aspirin to placebo in patients with low ABIs. However, neither study was able to demonstrate a reduction in fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events or, or revascularization with aspirin monotherapy. And it is worth mentioning that those patients notably were low-risk patients because their ABIs were borderline, 0.9 to 0.99. When you look at this meta-analysis, looking at 18 trials involving about 5,000 patients, patients who were taking aspirin monotherapy, there was a non-significant reduction in cardiovascular events. Now, this is looking at the whole patient population. However, 
um, um, if, if you uh, look at non-fatal stroke, there was a significant benefit to patients receiving aspirin therapy. So now you see why uh, our guidelines are giving a class 1A level of evidence A indication for patients receiving aspirin for symptomatic peripheral arterial disease and 2A for patients with asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease. Well, what about clopidogrel? Because this is the question that a lot of us revascularization specialists and even medical therapy vascular specialists ask ourselves on a daily basis. Should we place our patients on dual antiplatelet therapy? And the fact is the majority of patients around the country are by default placed on dual antiplatelet therapy post revascularization. So let's look at the evidence behind that. If you look at um, clopidogrel monotherapy, it was associated with small benefit compared to aspirin therapy alone. That was evident from an older cardiology trial, the Capri trial. So Plavix versus aspirin, there is a slight advantage to patients being on clopidogrel. However, there was a 23.8% relative risk reduction among patients with symptomatic PAD. So if you see there's a common theme here, the higher the risk in those patients, or the sicker the patient population of the subgroups, the larger the benefit in those patients. When you look at dual antiplatelet therapy in comparison to low-dose aspirin in the Charisma trial, there's really no significant difference between both arms. So the argument to maintaining patients on dual antiplatelet therapy, generally speaking, without tailing your therapy, is, is somewhat weak. And <clears throat> However, if the patient had symptomatic atherosclerotic or atherothrombotic disease, there was a slight benefit. Obviously, uh, we're not talking about coronary artery disease patients here because dual antiplatelet therapy uh, uh, in patients with acute coronary syndrome have been shown to be beneficial. Another trial looking at a propensity match observation, uh, uh, propensity match uh, scoring in patients undergoing endovascular intervention, there was a significant reduction in MACE among patients taking dual antiplatelet therapy in comparison to aspirin monotherapy. This discordant finding between this study and the Charisma trial might be explained by the inclusion of a cohort with more advanced atherosclerotic disease undergoing endovascular intervention, including greater than 50% of the patients that have CLI. So again, common theme, low-risk patient population does not necessarily benefit from the antiplatelet therapy. When you start moving into high-risk patient population, uh, especially the CLI population, there might be a benefit for those patients. Another trial, the CASPER trial, clopidogrel and uh, aspirin in bypass surgery for peripheral arterial disease patients. They studied dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin alone among patients undergoing below the knee surgical bypass. And interestingly enough, there was no difference for dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin alone in those patients. However, when they looked at the pre-specified uh, subgroup analysis for those patients, they found that there was some benefit in patients that are on dual antiplatelet therapy, and they have, um, they have received a synthetic graft. The ASPIRE PAD trial is an ongoing trial. It looks at antiplatelet strategy for peripheral arterial intervention for revascularization of lower extremities. It's currently evaluating comparative outcomes of one versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy after endovascular intervention. Interestingly, the study is supposed to close enrollment in June of 2018, and if you look recently at the NIH website, you will find that this time period has been extended to, to, to June 2019. All right, so. <coughs> the COMPASS trial is a landmark trial looking at rivaroxaban low-dose, 2.5 milligram therapy plus aspirin in comparison to rivaroxaban alone, 5 milligrams BID, and the third arm was aspirin monotherapy with 100, 100 milligrams. And the primary purpose of a COMPASS trial is to evaluate whether treatment with rivaroxaban plus aspirin or rivaroxaban alone is better than aspirin alone for the prevention of heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular death in patients with coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease. And the results were really um, encouraging and interesting. It, it, is, is, it was evident that patients who received low-dose rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams PID plus aspirin in comparison to aspirin monotherapy 
they had significant benefit in the, in the decrease of cardiovascular death, stroke, and uh, the composite endpoint uh, of those major outcomes. And if you look at that benefit, you'll notice that the benefit extends to coronary artery disease patients. One also extends to patients with peripheral arterial disease. What about bleeding? Because it's antithrombotic therapy. Um, it's 2.5 milligrams uh, twice a daily. So there was a slight increase in major bleeding in the rivaroxaban plus aspirin therapy in comparison to aspirin. However, there was no significant increase in fatal bleeding or there was no significant increase in intracranial hemorrhage uh, and also non-fatal other critical organ hemorrhage. So if you look at the net clinical benefit in terms of uh, treatment with low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin, primary plus severe bleeding event, overall there is uh, an advantage of that approach in comparison to aspirin therapy alone. So in conclusion, the COMPASS trial um, showed that rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram BID plus aspirin 100 milligram or low dose aspirin versus aspirin, low dose aspirin alone decreased the risk of cardiovascular death, stroke, and MI. There was increase in major bleeding. However, there was no significant increase in fatal intracranial or critical organ bleeding. Uh, so ultimately providing net clinical be benefit. And this really uh, is going to shape uh, our guidelines in terms of how we deliver therapy to this patient uh, subgroup. Just, uh, it's worth mentioning uh, to touch on antiplatelet therapy when, when you look at the Euclid trial that examined the use of ticagrelor versus clopidogrel in symptomatic peripheral arterial disease patients, it's worth mentioning that only 60 to 65 percent of patients were on aspirin, and there was no significant benefit, or in other words, there, actually there was no uh, advantage to the use of ticagrelor in comparison to, uh, to, to uh, Plavix. <coughs> and the observed cardiovascular event rate in the two groups, 4.42 percent per 100 patients per year, combined with the rates of acute limb ischemia, show uh, that there is further need for optimization for those patients. Also, it's worth mentioning that uh, they had about 5% of the patients in the Euclid trial that were, had the diagnosis of critical limb ischemia, and you can see that those patients had extremely worse outcomes, not necessarily because of treatment, but overall they had worse outcomes. They had a higher rate of cardiovascular mortality and morbidity for, for versus those patients without CLI. Now, um, we are extremely excited about the Voyager trial. The Voyager trial um, is finally examining uh, the treatment of rivaroxaban in patients that underwent revascularization. Now, granted, this revascularization might be endovascular, <coughs> excuse me, endovascular or surgical for a lot of those patients. And those patients are being followed at one, three, six, and um, uh, and every six months thereafter. This is an international trial, multi-center, uh, being led by Dr. by Dr. Hyatt. And the primary endpoints that we're looking at are cardiovascular death, MI, ischemic stroke, acute limb ischemia, and major amputation. This is this is an important uh, difference uh, from the COMPASS trial. Remember, the COMPASS trial is looking at stable PAD, stable coronary artery disease patients, not necessarily undergoing revascularization. And also, it's worth mentioning that uh, the Voyager trial will be looking at acute limb ischemia and limb loss for those patients. So those are sicker patient population with a higher event uh, uh, rate. So we're very excited to see the results of the trial, and, uh, and um, we'll, see, uh, we'll see the impact that uh, this treatment strategy will have on our patients. So in conclusion, optimal strategy for antiplatelet therapy is not clear. Tailored therapy will be important in complex peripheral vascular and CLI patients, and anticoagulation with antiplatelet therapy appears to have favorable outcome in certain PV and stable coronary artery disease patients. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, uh, my name is uh, Fadi Saab. I'm a cardiovascular specialist from Advanced Cardiac and Vascular Centers in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it's my pleasure today to have an esteemed panel of uh, physicians uh, joining me, joining us today to talk about uh, 
individualized secondary prevention strategies in PAD and the emerging role of factor 10A anticoagulation. It is my privilege to present my uh, co-panelist, uh, Dr. Michael uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Dr. Joshua Beckman, and Dr. Constantino Penia. Uh, we look forward to uh, having a lively discussion and a debate uh, to talk about the role of uh, factor 10A anticoagulation um, and uh, uh, discussing the emerging role of uh, therapy, especially in PAD patients. Um, so before we start uh, uh, having questions, we we'll look forward to hearing your questions. Uh, there's a couple of sli uh, slides that I would like to go over just to um, uh, refresh the memory of everyone about the most recent landmark trial, COMPASS trial, looking at the role of uh, rivaroxaban in comparison to antiplatelet therapy in patients with uh, uh, the stable peripheral arterial disease. Uh, the COMPASS trial was really uh, groundbreaking in the sense that we, for the first time, we looked at the role of anti factor 10A anticoagulation um, um, in patients with stable peripheral arterial disease. And the results of the trial, <coughs> excuse me, the results of the trial came back and it was absolutely showing benefit and advantage and a clinical net benefit for patients who are receiving rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams BAD plus low dose aspirin versus aspirin monotherapy. Um, I believe associated with this webcast is going to be the lively discussion that we had at the ISAT meeting uh, with my esteemed panel here. And if, uh, if everyone is able to see uh, the slide that's looking at major adverse events, you can see that there's a, a clear benefit to the use of rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin monotherapy alone. And that benefit extends to patients with major amputation. And if you look at the next, next slide, um, uh, evaluating um, uh, those outcomes, you will notice that the most advantageous regimen for patients with stable peripheral arterial disease was mostly the rivaroxaban plus aspirin in comparison to um, aspirin monotherapy uh, alone. Now, the COMPASS trial has, uh, um, uh, there's uh, obviously other things that uh, we can go through and discuss. One thing that's worth mentioning, um, and I think it's, it's very important to point out, that the rate of uh, life-threatening uh, bleeding, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, in the, the peroxaban arm, uh, um, although was higher, but did not have a net clinical negative impact um, patient outcomes. So patients end up benefiting from being under Broxaban plus aspirin in comparison to aspirin monotherapy alone. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask uh, uh, our, one of our team panelists here, Dr. Jeff. Um, you know, you always. Uh, 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 talk about the importance of medical therapy in patients with uh, uh, coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease. Uh, what's your feeling about uh, the the change? Um, how did it change your practice compass trial in terms of your patient population that you see on a regular basis? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Saab. Uh, great to be on with my colleagues here. Well, I think this is one of the most impactful trials for true clinical change in practice that I've seen in my career, maybe since the Capri trial, quite frankly. Uh, this trial suggests in a very large cohort, in a beautifully done study, that low-dose rivaroxaban in addition to aspirin has a significant reduction in major adverse limb events and mortality. And for that reason, uh, it has truly changed our practice. Patients who have stable claudication, for example, uh, are now considered to receive optimal medical therapy with the addition of the now FDA-approved on-label indication uh, for rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams BID. So I think it's had a significant impact. Uh, Dr. Beckman, what would you say? As per usual, Dr. Jeff, I agree with everything you said. I think the really there's a couple of really interesting things, and Dr. Saab made clear one of the most important parts of this. Um, I think 
Most of our medical therapy in the past has been directed primarily at cardiac outcomes and stroke outcomes in, a, in a, an attempt to reduce uh, events like death, heart attack, and stroke. We haven't really had, with, with few exceptions, uh, medications that can significantly affect limb outcomes. Those of us who are in practice and have to talk to patients have had to do this weird two-step where we have to tell patients that they have disease in their legs and we're giving them medicines to prevent events in their heart and stroke. Now, now as we have our conversation about atherosclerosis being a systemic process, we can provide a medication that not only reduces heart attack and stroke, but will help them keep their limbs as well. And I think that provides a unique uh, advantage and advance in this field. Josh, I think that's a, this is Tino Pena. I think that is a great point that you've made there and the importance of now having studies that actually look at limb events and, and allows us to speak to our patients. Um, I have a question concerning uh, when you see a patient in your office identified with risk factors and the patient's asymptomatic but has PAD, how, you know, we usually, how do you transition these patients from a traditional antiplatelet regimen two to 2.5 milligram of uh, ribavirin. Uh, you know, is there a way to start? Is there a group that you'd say would be the best way to start and build uh, our comfort level in terms of managing these patients? Would you like me to take that one? Yeah, Josh. All right. Well, Tino, I think, you know, it's a really good question because it's a, uh, you know, like most physicians, when there's something new, I want to try it first in the patients in whom I think it'll have the biggest benefit before I begin to expand it out to everybody. Um, and so what I, how I started was that I, I basically looked at the patients based on three criteria. One, did they have, do they have diabetes? Because the diabetic patients with PAD have a particularly high rate of adverse events. Number two, do, did they have, do they have symptomatic PAD or PAD that's been revascularized? Patients who have advanced symptomatic peripheral artery disease will certainly gain some benefit. And then the last criteria for me was, did they have evidence of atherosclerosis in another bed, vascular bed? And so if you just took those three groups, which would be in the range of 60 to 70% of all PAD patients, that would be the group of people in whom I would feel really comfortable giving this a shot. Now, how do I switch over? If they're on aspirin 325, I drop them down to 81, and I add on, uh, I add on the rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily. If they're on clopidogrel alone, I'll change them to aspirin and start the rivaroxaban. And if they're on dual antiplatelet therapy, which... Uh, outside of maybe getting some kind of endovascular uh, endovascular procedure within the last month or so, uh, I just stop the clopidogrel and exchange it for the rivaroxaban. Because basically, clopidogrel monotherapy has a role based on large clinical trials. Dual antiplatelet therapy does not. And there's no evidence that high-dose aspirin is any better than low-dose aspirin. So uh, I make the switch really quickly. And I, you know, I bring up the trial in the, uh, on the computer screen in my office, and I show them. I say the benefit here starts literally within a month or two. So, you know, and they look at the information, and every patient so far has been convinced. Great. I think that's really important. I like the way you present that to the patients, and I think that uh, that's really important. We have a question for Dr. Saab. Dr. Saab, with all the interventions that we perform that require dual antiplatelet therapy for some time post-procedure, how do you manage this now, and when do you consider transitioning a patient after a procedure to aspirin plus vivaroxaban? You know, uh, Tino, that's a great question, and, uh, and uh, you know, one cannot answer that question without saying that, well, we have an ongoing uh, the trial uh, that finished enrollment that a lot of us are eagerly awaiting the results. Uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the uh, participating PIs in the Voyager trial that's looking at low-dose rivaroxaban in, uh, plus aspirin versus um, uh, aspirin plus placebo in patients that underwent uh, 
revascularization for symptomatic peripheral vascular disease. And to answer your question, um, it, it, it really revolves around how does the clinician or how do we feel about when do you move your patient from uh, stable, uh, from revascularization phase to, okay, I think this patient is a stable peripheral arterial disease patient that's asymptomatic, as Dr. Beckman mentioned. And um, that varies depending on the patient presentation. So for patients with uh, critical limb ischemia, unfortunately, um, we, have, we have not um, been uh, making the switch to, from, as, uh, from as, dual antiplatelet therapy to aspirin plus rivaroxaban uh, unless the patient has, uh, uh, if they have rest pain, they have complete, uh, the rest pain symptoms have completely resolved at six months, or if their wound has completely healed, uh, then we make the, the switch to, quote, unquote, uh, uh, stable peripheral arterial disease slash CLI patients. Uh, the, the number six months came from just anecdotally from our own experience. We have a large peripheral vascular population, peripheral vascular disease population, and uh, six months seems, quite, quite frankly, stable enough for a lot of those patients. Uh, also, the, the six months uh, duration comes from the fact that we're looking, uh, a lot of our CLI, well, most recent CLI trials have been looking at outcomes for CLI patients at six months. Uh, but but I have to repeat what I just said earlier. You know, we're, we're really waiting for the Voyager trial to hopefully give us some guidance uh, for a lot of those patients. So I, but I think, Fadi, you have given us good guidance in terms of evaluation of these patients in the periprocedural period and trying to get an idea, periprocedural, are they still active? Um, is it something that's stable disease and then make the switch? I, I think uh, you need uh, some good advice there, and we'll, we will be looking for the uh, Voyager trial. Um, the next question, I think, is uh, for Dr. Jaff. Um, Dr. Jaff, obviously you discussed about the incredible problem we have with the underutilization of cardioprotective medications in patients with PAD. Can you discuss a little bit about the types of medications you would consider when you see an asymptomatic patient or even a symptomatic patient in your office at PAD? Sure. Uh, so, you know, I view those patients as coronary artery disease equivalents. And if they're not already on guideline-directed maximal medical therapy, uh, we discuss every single one of those. So first, I would start with the role of lifestyle modification. So if they're cigarette smokers, uh, you know, the most effective maneuver for that is to talk about the need for stopping smoking, uh, get them into a program if they're interested in doing that, starting them on uh, on uh, nicotine replacement therapies, um, and and even Welbutrin or Bupropion if, uh, if need be. So then we talk about, if they have diabetes, the importance of the role of controlling and managing their diabetes, which would include everything around foot care and foot protection, good fitting shoes, self-examination, things like that. Then we would go into antiplatelet therapy. So that's kind of what we've been talking to this afternoon. So I won't be reiterating that. Antihypertensive therapy, I think we all would agree that uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor antagonists are first line treatments along with calcium, antag calcium channel antagonists but there's obviously a huge panoply of combination therapies for hypertension. Um, hyperlipidemia, these are patients who deserve maximal high-intensity statin therapy. So we would talk about um, resuvastatin or atorvastatin at, at a high dose. Um, and, and then, of course, we would get into exercise therapy, particularly if they had symptomatic claudication uh, that didn't have features suggesting of more advanced disease requiring revascularization. Great. What are, we have someone in the audience that's asked a question, and that has to do with what treat, treatment regimen would you recommend for someone with normal pulse ABI but has a moderate calcium score on CT screening? So having some, some uh, marker of cardiovascular disease somewhat on a screen, would you affect, would, would, uh, would that be someone that you may consider a treat, treatment regimen? I'm going to ask Dr. Beckman to see what his answer would be or what he would think about this. The first thing I do is I want to know who made the $200 for this patient to get the screening <laughs> study. Because, I, you know, this is, 
I'm going to say this in the wrong way. This is a first world problem. There aren't that, there just aren't that many patients who want to spend this kind of money out of pocket to do their own screening. That said, there is no evidence as to what you should do when someone who had who, an asymptomatic person has uh, evidence of, cal- of uh, calcium screening, uh, you know, calcium in their coronaries. And so um, I consider them asymptomatic because most people in the United States, depending on how old they are, have some evidence. So I don't put them on an aspirin anymore because we've had three large aspirin trials, which are neutral to only minuscule benefits. But I'm a strong believer in statins. And so, again, every, almost every man over 60 already qualifies for a statin based on, the, uh, based on the risk score from the AHA and ACC. And so I'd likely put this person on a statin. I mean, this is the same kind of thing as we always see. I would, I would see the patient in front of me. If they have a strong family history, I'm more likely to put them on a set. I would not, I would not put them on aspirin and rivaroxaban in this setting. There's no way, in no way comes close to what the patients look like in the trial. And I do not, I do not have any good understanding of the risk benefit analysis in this kind of person. Uh, Josh, I think you bring up a very, a very good point. And that is really this trial really worked and I think went out of its way to really get patients that had known CAD and PAD. And that patient population had three or four different criteria that would make, allow it to be enrolled. And what we're looking at here is a patient population, like you said, that was relatively asymptomatic, may have some risk factor. And uh, I, I like your answer with that. Dr. Jeff, would you add anything different there? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, the, you know, you we all try and practice based on the literature, and so you don't want to extrapolate the powerful findings from Compass into populations that were not included, uh, because then, of course, you're not practicing based on the literature and putting potentially patients at risk from a, at least from a financial standpoint, if not from a uh, comorbidity of the drug standpoint. So I agree completely. All right. I'm going to switch a little bit to question and uh, and go and ask a little bit more of a scientific question. And, and I'm curious what the speakers feel is, you know, is the benefit of this drug regimen related to the fact that we're getting two hits on the anticoagulation clotting cascade by having an antiplatelet medication and having a 10A inhibitor? What do you guys uh, think about in terms of the mechanism for, for this type of regimen? Uh, Josh, you want to go first? Sure. So this, this to me is one of the most fascinating aspects of this, of this clinical trial. Obviously, there was, an, there was a, an acute coronary syndrome trial a bunch of years ago, and you can tell how much the community did not believe it because there was a mortality benefit at the 2.5 milligram twice daily dose, but not at the 5 milligram dose. Well, I think what we've learned and I'm going to say it this way, what we've learned is that very low-dose factor 10A inhibition seems to have outsized benefits for atherosclerosis that are not carried over if you increase the dose to a full venous thrombosis, atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation dose. I've never, it's rare, I think the only other thing I can think of is that low-dose ACE inhibitors have about the same benefit as high-dose ACE inhibitors in heart failure. But I can't really think of another circumstance where the low-dose medicine is so much better than the high-dose medicine um, in a specific clinical circumstance like this. Going back to your question specifically, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that the benefit uh, right here seems to to come from the two pathways that are – uh, inhibited, rather than uh, rather than anyone alone. Uh, although it is notable in slide three, there does seem to be a little bit of a catch up with the higher dose of rivaroxaban, um, and I think it's unfortunate that we're never going to really figure out what happens in the longer term because the trial was ended early. But for now, and certainly in the first couple of years, it's clear the combination is significantly superior. Dr. Jeff, anything to add about the combination and how it may affect in terms of the, the, 
biology of it affecting two areas on the clotting cascade. Well, I mean, it's hard to add anything to Josh. He's really one of the most uh, keenly aware uh, clinical translational scientists we have in the field. So all I would say is that, you know, there's been some recent data. Now, this would not necessarily have an impact on uh, survival, but it might have an impact on limb outcomes. I'm curious what Josh and, and Fadi think about this. You know, there's been some data that was published that talks about the unanticipated pathologic finding of thrombi in patients with chronic peripheral artery disease. And so is there a potential that even a low dose of rivaroxaban in addition to an antiplatelet agent like aspirin might mitigate some of the bad limb outcomes that we're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is as good a uh, sur- surmise as anyone I've heard. I think that um, we there is just a physiology here that I don't think we understand. Um, and you know, it's um, I mean, this is you got to remember this is major or major amputations. This is just in a way something we've never seen. And I think I think the potential for a thrombotic component to this disease that we really didn't take either seriously or know more know enough about is a good is as good a place to start as any. I would agree with Michael. You know, I would uh, I would uh, just like to add that if if you if you really look at at the the, the progression of trials, even looking at antiplatelet or dual antiplatelet therapy trials, and and if you ever like dissect the subgroups that they looked at, you know there is as as the patients get sicker, if, if, I mean, you know, we, we have to use that term, uh, or or the risk is higher, albeit patients with synthetic bypass craft, albeit patients uh, or CLI patients, those are the patients that benefited the most. So to piggyback on the earlier statements, uh, we're really, you know, looking forward to the Voyager trial because looking at a sick at a sicker patient population with a higher percentage of CLI patients. And it's also looking at the acute limb ischemia. So we're eagerly awaiting the results. We're hoping that a lot of clinicians, you know, that that uh, that treat those patients medically on a daily basis or intervene on them, uh, albeit via surgery or endovascular therapy, uh, we're finally um, hopefully going to have a conclusive answer rather than us anecdotally trying to treat those patients uh, based on our prior experiences. Yeah. I mean, I think when when we take a look at what we've covered today and we've talked to really expose, you know, what we all know about this underutilization, suboptimal preventive practices in patients with PAD, and now we took a look at the studies have already that have come through looking at at a number of medications, whether it's anticoagulants as Coumadin, whether we're looking at antiplatelet medications and all the studies that that have been done. It's amazing that we have this trial now that's been released an indication to, to help us uh, treat our patients with really a male composite endpoint. Uh, end so we're looking at you know what was traditionally just MACE, and now we've added limb events, which I think really helps us to, to guide the management for our patients. I can only imagine as hopefully when Voyager comes out, it's going to even give us a little bit more direction for even our, even our sicker patients um, in, in the uh, that, that we're treating. Um, at this time, I wanted to... Uh, Thank all of our participants, all of our presenters. Um, hopefully, uh, this was helpful, and uh, we can again continue to educate on how we can apply such great data, such a great study to our daily practice. So, thank you very much. <laughs>